Hello, it's Mrs. Glasson. How are you doing? Students, the many moods of Mrs. Glasson. Have you got used to them yet? At the start of previous videos, chronologically and in alphabetical order, you have found me alacritous, bellicose, curmudgeonly, dejected and elated. And today you find me frivolous, frivolous but not flippant. Wonderful words beginning with F. Come on students, let's go. But before any frivolity can take place, you'll be relieved to learn that we're going to talk about two very serious aspects of 11 plus and indeed all English study, fiction and non-fiction. Now, I know that you know what fiction is and what non-fiction is. But I have given you these really, really easy, basic definitions for a purpose because when I was looking at some of the definitions that you can get of fiction and non-fiction, for fiction it says something like um, arises from the imagination and for non-fiction, implicitly, it doesn't arise from the imagination. It's not imagined experience. However, hopefully, 11 plus students and other English students, you have been taught that this isn't strictly true. So fiction, let's just put to one side. I'm aware that you know it's, um, for example, description or narrative. Um, however, with non-fiction, so with transactional writing, what 11 plus, um, what real English teachers call transactional writing, formal letters, informal letters, for example, even though they are, in inverted commas, non-fiction, um, they are really written partly from your imagination. So, for example, a formal letter in an 11 plus exam is not merely supposed to sound and read uh, like a formal letter. It's supposed to be written like a formal letter that's written from an for an English exam. And that's different from a formal letter. Similarly, with informal letters, I was reading the other day on a Facebook page and it was, I think it was, well, it was something that was written by another tutor. And it said, don't forget, your informal letters got to sound like and, and read like it's it's a real informal letter. So you've got to write your informal letter as if it's a real informal letter. No, that's not true. You've got to write your informal letter as though it's a real informal letter that's written for an English exam. And that's different. And that's something that I teach my students. Um, and that's something that I really do address in the 11 plus foundation course so year four students you can arrive at live tuition knowing this stuff and of course i revise that with the 11 plus revision course because hopefully by the time you're taking my revision course you've taken live online tuition and you've been taught creative writing and you've been taught this fundamental aspect of non-fiction creative writing written for an 11 plus creative writing exam or indeed any creative writing exam. So fiction and non-fiction, not real and real, fiction coming from the imagination and 11 plus non-fiction really for you to score the highest marks has to come from a place of imagination as well. There's got to be a mixture. Anyway, that was very serious and actually very serious in terms of 11 plus creative writing. Uh, and as you know, I was an 11 plus creative writing examiner. So I've had a lot of experience of children who have not been taught correctly. And this point is very, very important. OK, now we've had the serious bit. Let's get on with the frivolity, shall we? So, I did say at the start that I was feeling frivolous. So that means fun, not 
serious. Frivolity being the abstract noun and frivolous being the adjective. By way of context, let's have a look at these sentences. Stop being so flippant about your homework. This frivolous attitude to studying must change. So there we have flippant and frivolous in these sentences, exemplifying that they definitely do have negative connotations. So being lighthearted and serious in these contexts, they can be very, very negative indeed. Don't be flippant. Don't have a frivolous attitude to your studying. So foreshadowing, a really important literary device. Dickens uses it. Um, for example, the fog at the start of Bleak House the mists in Great Expectations, um, the, which kind of proliferate throughout his narrative. Foreshadowing. Most skilled writers, excellent writers, use this literary technique. So, for example, Dickens, the a fog at the start of Bleak House, that really, really significant and famous opening in, in English literature, which I use to teach symbolism and figurative writing. My year fives look at that as an example of how to write well. Um, similarly with Shakespeare, his use of storms, um, when there's a storm in a Shakespearean tragedy, you know that either something bad has happened or something bad is about to happen, usually both. So, for example, let's just think off the top of my head. When poor old King Duncan was murdered in Macbeth, and there are some shocking storms in that play, aren't there? Terrible weather. Um, what a terrible storm there was. From memory, um, chimney stacks were blown down. And the owl uh, killed the raven and the king's horses allegedly went wild and ate each other. Shadowing can be written into narratives in, in many ways. It can be a surreptitious glance from one of your protagonists. Um, certainly clouds gathering in the sky often presage disaster. Thunder and lightning often foreshadows the imminent arrival of disaster. And don't forget, in an English exam, you don't have much time to impress a creative writing examiner. So you should use all of these different literary techniques. And I do do this exercise. So as you know, I use examples of GCSE creative writing. Um, these boys who are awarded 100% by the creative writing examiner for their descriptions and their narratives. I use those narratives and descriptions to teach my year fours and fives creative writing. And it's a really excellent exercise. So when we annotate these essays, um, just in one paragraph, you will find foreshadowing, um, zoomorphism, personification, onomatopoeia, visual imagery. So all of the different techniques that I teach in that lesson five, um, and that's just the literary, they're just the literary devices. Of course, then there are the syntactical devices. So the range of sentence types that must be integrated and showcased. Um, the different punctuation that must be showcased and the different grammatical devices that must be showcased as well as the vocabulary. The key word there being showcasing. But I'm sure that you have been taught all of this in your um, creative writing. Well, I hope that you have. And if you're in year five and you haven't, then there's still time. There's the 11 plus revision course. But foreshadowing a really important and significant literary device. 
And this is why we analyze the work of great writers and we deconstruct the work of great writers um, in order to become better writers ourselves. And of course, it makes us excellent at making those inferences. So it helps with comprehension and creative writing and of course, vocabulary. Now, when I was looking at foreshadowing, I did what you all know I love to do, which is to Google foreshadowing on the internet. And I went on many literary websites because I'm a teacher of English, but I never stop being a student of English. And that's something I really encourage you to do. Be an independent, proactive learner. And I found this really excellent website and I'm going to share it with you now so that after I finish this tutorial, you can go on there and you can find out all sorts of things that are going to help you to become better English students. Here it is. Uh, I'll share the link for the website uh, underneath the video for you to look at. But here are some wonderful examples of foreshadowing. So different types, dialogue, such as, I have a bad feeling about this. Well, that's not particularly implicit, certainly, but it gives you an idea. Symbols, definitely, such as blood, types of birds. Remember ravens, um, traditionally um, symbols of, of bad omen. Uh, weapons, certain colours also, weather motifs, which I've mentioned. So storm clouds, fog, mist, wind, rain, clearing skies often foreshadow that positive things are about to happen. Um, prophecies, omens such as a broken mirror, character reactions, apprehension, curiosity, secrecy. How does somebody utter something? How does somebody move? Time or season? So classic, um, you know, this idea of implicit meaning, meanings in literature. Um, midnight, um, gothic text, terrible things happen under cover of midnight. Dawn, the harbinger of uh, new life and positive, pleasant things. Spring as well, winter, um, settings such as graveyards, poor old Pip at the start of Great Expectations, he even knew it was never going to end well, was it? Battlefields, an isolated path or a river. And similarly, my brilliant uh, creative writers in year four, in year five, GCSE, and so on, because they've been taught in a certain way. They naturally know how to um, entwine implicit meanings into their writing. The idea of polysemy, um, and that's in free lesson two. Oh, gosh, I haven't mentioned my free lessons yet. I just have there. So you should have a look at free lesson two. And here we have examples of titles with foreshadowing. So The Fall of the House of Usher, brilliant by Poe. Uh, that's Edgar Allan Poe, the American writer, not the Teletubby. Murder on the Orient Express doesn't leave much to the imagination, but it gives you the idea. Um, Agatha Christie. Love in the Time of Cholera, G Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Brilliant. The Story of an Hour. Um, Kate Chopin. So some brilliant uh, works of literature there. Uh, with examples of titles with foreshadowing. And I love this also, some famous examples of foreshadowing before I leave you students to peruse this, at, peruse this at your leisure. Foreshadowing is an effective device, it says here. Uh, we know that. The killing of the albatross in the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Tut, tut. Oh, if only he hadn't done that, but then we wouldn't have this brilliant work of literature and this brilliant example of foreshadowing students. The dark, bleak, midnight setting in The Raven. The Raven, a short story by Edgar Allan Poe. That reminds me, I'm going to set that for my year fives to read over the holiday. I've already done um, mystery and suspense writing with them, how to use short sentences, how to use adverbial clauses, etc., etc. I must get them to read The Raven and you should read it too. And this is why I love to do my research. Look down here. 
English students. Gosh, after I finish this video, I'm going to sit here for hours and hours having fun finding out all about these things. And I hope you will too. I bet you can't wait. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed learning about those words beginning with F today. And you can tell it's been a good English lesson. I have been left with a pile of books on my desk. Absolutely fantastic. Um, and I hope by now you have pressed the pink subscribe button and subscribed to my channel. Not just so that you don't miss the free video tutorials on vocabulary. I mean, obviously you don't want to do that, but I'm going to be putting some more videos on here as well, which will be interest, which will be of interest to 11 plus students and their parents and of interest to all tested in English. And on that note, I hope by now that you have been enjoying these tutorials, which will help you to, can you join in? You must be able to join in by now. Elevate your Lexis, make your diction more dexterous and make your English exemplary. Enjoy yourselves. I bet you're going to look at that website right now, aren't you? I will see you next time.